Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113-4114 for spring 2022, talking about David Walker's appeal. So here's a key quotation from this work, which dates from the 1820s. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. So here's an argument he's making, which is key to this pamphlet, which is reclaiming the labor of Black Americans for themselves against the slave system and saying that the work they've done and they've poured into this country gives them not only as much right to it as white people, but more right to it than white people because they've worked harder and in worse conditions. So that's a counter argument, of course, against slavery and for Black dignity. But there's also another kind of implicit argument that I'm offering against those things here on this page. So the man who's pictured here is not David Walker. We have no photograph or engraving or portrait of him. He died quite young and, and in poverty, but he did leave behind a son who was born in 1830, more or less posthumously to his father, who his father died of tuberculosis or was rumored to have been poisoned in Boston. But it's said that his son, Edward G. Walker, looked a lot like his father. And that connection between father and son is something that the American slave system denied. It's something that simply didn't matter, that the condition of slavery or freedom was passed down from the mother in American law. This is why David Walker was born free. His mother was a free Black woman. His father was an enslaved Black man. But this connection here then between father and son is something that the American slave system would have simply denied. They would have said there is no relationship between son and father in this system. So simply by sharing with you a picture of his son, I'm continuing the kind of argument that David Walker made in his appeal. His son incidentally went on to be one of the first black lawyers in Massachusetts and <laughs> sat in the House of Representatives and then had some political difficulties because of his beliefs and still managed to remain a person of political importance in Massachusetts until his death in 1901. He even ran for president on, uh, on, a, on a, the Negro line, I think was the name of the party, uh, basically a, a black political party. So this is a sense of what David Walker left the world apart from his appeal. So the work itself, Walker's appeal in four articles, uh, to the colored citizens of the world is targeting multiple uh, things. One of course is the history of slavery. Uh, it was often said that the blacks um, should simply look at the conditions of slaves elsewhere and see that they themselves are kind of uniquely unsuited for freedom because other slaves have done well. And he says, no, in fact, in the Roman system, a freed slave can go on to become a person of some political importance. If we see, if we read the Bible, we can see that although Moses was uh, from a family of enslaved Jews, that he was able to be elevated into the position of being a key advisor to the Pharaoh and so forth. But in America, no black man free and certainly not enslaved was allowed to have any position of political importance whatsoever. So his argument there is to say, the reason that we don't do well is because we are legally and by extra legal means as well, barred from doing well. And that the comparison to us, to other slaves will simply show that our condition is worse. He also targets collaborations blacks. He tells a story of a group of enslaved people who were being brought further south. And then there was uh, a brief uprising there where one of the people bringing them south was, was killed and the other one was woefully injured. And it seemed like they were all going to get away and gain their freedom from themselves. But one of them, this woman among the group, helped out one of the people who had been injured and with the result that basically everybody was recaptured. And he thinks that's just terrible because they should have just killed the people who were trying to enslave them, taken their money and made their way north. That would be the only just thing to do.
Um, but he's also going after satisfied Blacks, saying that there are Black people in this country who believe that the kind of free labor, if they're free people, then doing is adequate to them. He points to someone who cleans shoes. They think that the education they're getting is adequate. And he says, these people who think of themselves as educated aren't very educated at all. And of course, he's thinking about his own work, quite considerable to get educate himself and saying, these people are satisfied. They should not be satisfied. They should be dissatisfied. He's trying to stir them up to outrage, anger, rebellion, and eventually the violent overthrow of the slave system. Um, he's also targeting the notion of African colonization by free African Americans, aka the Back to Africa movement, which is something that really kicks off in America in the 1820s. And so it's a very hot political item in his day <laughs> and continues to be so for quite some time afterwards. And he says really that this movement is not in fact beneficial to black people in America. All that it's going to do is to remove free black people from America and leave the people who are black people and enslaved in America in a condition that's worse off because they will have no one left to advocate for them. And it will simply leave the slave system even more firmly in control. So here he's targeting chiefly the white people who are arguing for this and he leaves the black advocates for it alone. And of course, his primary target are white slavers. Uh, and he warns them that basically fire and blood and death is coming for them from somebody or other, or perhaps even from God. And he goes after some of their chief apologists from Thomas Jefferson in his work Notes on Virginia, which has some terrifically awful things to say about black people. And Henry Clay, who is a very important political figure in America in the first part of the 19th century. So some of the interesting things that jump out to me in this work is, of course, his discussion of the humans, the kind of thing that I pay attention to in my own research. I notice that these words appear quite often that human appears 27 times, brute appears 24 times, beast appears three times, uh, animal appears only three times, so human and brute is a primary division that he draws, and he writes things like this. He says, Blacks, once you get them started, glory and death. The whites have had us under them for more than three centuries, murdering and treating us like brutes. And as Mr. Jefferson wisely said, they have never found us out. And then he turns those words against Jefferson. They do not know indeed that there is an unconquerable disposition in the breasts of the blacks, which when it is fully awakened and put in motion will be subdued only with the destruction of the animal existence. And that's quite interesting, isn't it? He says animal existence. Here he simply means that capacity to be alive, only death can put that down. And then he writes, get the black started. And if you do not have a gang of tigers and lions to deal with, I am a deceiver of the blacks and of the whites. And so this is something I'd like us to talk about in class. What is the relationship between that metaphor that Walker is using here comparing Blacks who are fighting for their rights to tigers and lions in his argument that Blacks need to be recognized as human beings against those who would reduce them to the condition of brutes. So he's, he's using animal comparisons in a variety of ways, sometimes to elevate Black people and sometimes to mark the way that they have been degraded under the slave system. So um, there is also some, one of the effects that David Walker's appeal had was to create, uh, basically result in a series of white supremacist laws to try to control it because he was very interested in having this work distributed through the South because he really did want to raise an uprising. So he uh, made his money as a used clothing merchant. He would be actually working near bars and sailors would flip, come into town in Boston and they would get really drunk. And eventually if they started running out of money, if they're gambling or drinking too much, <clears throat> they would sell their clothes. And not maybe the clothes that they were wearing, but the, clo the extra clothes that they had. So this is a time before enormous mass production of clothing. So you could get a little more money for it than you could now. And uh, he managed to take those clothes and then he would sell them to other sailors who were coming to town and needed maybe some, some extra outfitting. And what he would often do would take copies of his appeal and put it into the trousers of these clothes that he was selling them, knowing that the sailors would travel to the South uh, on their mercantile voyages, and therefore would inadvertently import copies of this 
with them into the South. Perhaps they would read it on the way there and perhaps they'd find it interesting. Or perhaps they would just get drunk again and sell their clothes. Maybe a free black person, say Savannah or some other Southern uh, port city would get a hold of clothing, find this pamphlet in it and know what to do with it. So this is, this is an interesting plan he had. And so he says in this work, the bare name of educating colored people scares our cruel oppressors almost to death. And so here are some of the laws that were passed in the General Assembly of the state of North Carolina in 1830. We see similar laws in Georgia, Louisiana, and in other Southern states. So they say, being enacted by the General Assembly of the state of North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera, that any person shall knowingly bring into the state with an intent to circulate or knowingly circulate or publish within the state, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, anything whose evident tendency whereof would be to excite insurrection, conspiracy, or resistance in the slaves or free Negroes and persons of color within the state, what shall happen to them? Well, for the first offense, they'll be imprisoned not less than one year and put in the pillory and whipped at the discretion of the court. And for the second offense, shall suffer death without benefit of clergy. There's no evidence that anyone was executed specifically for importing Walker's appeal, but you can see how terrified the white slavers were by this pamphlet, by the laws that they passed against it. They also tried to shut it down this way, be it further enacted that any person that if any person shall by words endeavor to excite in any slave or slaves or free Negro or person of color, a spirit of insurrection, conspiracy or rebellion, such a person shall be deemed guilty of felony and so on. They'll be lashed 39 times. They also say in the very next law that you are not allowed to teach slaves to read and write because it has quote, a tendency to excite dissatisfaction in their minds and produced insurrection and rebellion to the manifest injury of the citizens of this state. And by citizens, of course, they mean white people and white slavers in particular. So they know what they're doing. And David Walker knew what he was doing too. He wanted black people to be educated and he wanted them to be educated so they could read revolutionary material. So they'd become discontent. And so they would rise up and kill the white slavers. This is his goal. The white slavers recognize this perfectly well and they passed laws to shut it down. Um, they also said that if any slave shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any other slave to read or write, the use of figures accepted, he or she may be carried before any justice of the peace and on conviction thereof shall be sentenced to receive 39 lashes on his or her bear back. And I think that's the key phrase right there, the use of figures accepted. That is numbers. They are allowed to teach numbers to enslaved Black people. And that is perfectly fine. And we can talk about why that is in class, but I think you probably think about why that is. So uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about is eschatology. If you don't know what this word means, look it up. I'm not going to tell it to you right now. And, and so he says, they want slaves and they want us for their slaves, but some of them, meaning white people, will curse the day they ever saw us. That's a pretty intense thing to say. So this, of course, makes a great many appeals to religion. God is a word that appears 197 times in this work. It's probably the most common noun in the entire appeal. Jesus appears 27 times. Justice, incidentally, also appears 18 times, and I think you will find justice and God linked quite frequently in this work. So here is what I'd like you to think about for Tuesday. And just please write me a little something and send it to me. Could you just comment on the differences between Ephemiano's Christianity and David Walker's? What's a key line from Walker that illustrates this difference? If indeed you see a key difference, if you have time, do you notice any similarities? And so this is what I'd like us to begin by talking about on Tuesday, in addition to some of the other questions I've posed. So thank you so much for listening.